What is good, everybody? What is good? We're here, Coast to Coast Podcast. Glad everybody could be a part of the show tonight. Happy to have you. As always, we're still getting into the swing of things with this uh, this liveness, this live uh, live shenanigans and doing things right. My head's hat's not even square. Man, I'm going to talk to the people in makeup for getting me, getting me looking right before we get on here. Sherell has a nice yard behind him. Got some nature back there. Sean has his typical uh, white padded room, which I'm assuming is keeping him sane. Fellas, how y'all feeling tonight? What's going on? What's good? Coast to coast, Sean Moran, left coast, Sherelle McMillan, right coast. How y'all doing? Good to see everybody after uh, not being on the last one with you two. Yeah, man. Well, yeah, things happen. World keeps spinning, whether we can make it or not. We certainly missed you. Sherelle, how you living, dude? I'm good. I kind of froze up there for a second, and there's a hummingbird just dangerously close to my ears. So hey, hey. If I get attacked out here. Up. Yeah, I'm not. I, I am. I am old enough to where I respect <laughs> birds. I get a little. I get a little avian love in me now. That's how old I am. I saw. I saw something on a, on a reels on social the other day where somebody was like, "Yeah, I'm old enough to where now I like see a bird and if I don't know what it is, I get pissed off." That's kind of where I'm living. Um, shout out to all the people that are already in the chat joining us tonight. Uh, again, we're we're getting better about doing this thing live, but uh, certainly enjoy being able to interact with folks live. Uh, Sherelle, no pressure, but uh, Vipless is in the chat again, so um, I don't know if that's going to make your life easier or hard, but uh, we're glad to have Vip here, too, checking up on us, making sure we're doing things right. I'm looking forward to to teaming up with Vip to do a, a pod here very soon um, for the Players' Lounge, so I uh, hope you guys are, are ready for that, even if you're you know, maybe uh, not really into the IC football stuff. Hopefully, you can get into it, but uh, Coast to Coast Podcast, I'm Joey Powell. As I mentioned, Sean Moran, Sherelle Milner here. We're brought to you by Johnny T-Shirt. And, fellas, let's get rolling. Uh, Sherelle, I think the biggest thing folks want to hear, and you teased it a little bit earlier this week, is is the ongoing saga of UNC's pursuit of Jaron Stevenson, kid from right here in Pittsburgh, really close to campus. Uh, you shared some things that had developed recently. You know, when he visited just a couple of weeks ago, you know, reclassing was on the table, um, trying to decide when he was, you know, when he was going to join UNC, if he was going to commit to UNC. Uh, so share what you can about how that's developed so folks can kind of get the, the most recent news and a, a decent update on, on Mr. Stevenson. Yeah, again, just to reset, like Joey said, he's a six, nine and a half, six ten, depending on who you ask, uh, power forward from uh, Seaforth High School in Pittsburgh. Uh, his mother played basketball at UNC for Coach Sylvia Hatchell. Um, his dad uh, is from Fayetteville. Shout out to 910. Uh, he played at the University of Richmond. Uh, back in in the mid '90s, and then had a, a long career uh, overseas, uh, mostly in Asia. So they moved back when Jaron was, I think, 11 or 12, and since then he's kind of progressed as uh, uh, a recruit, as as a you know a top player in the country. And his recruitment has gone on now for a couple of years. He was the first player in the class of 2024 to pick up an offer from Hubert Davis. Uh, this was before Hubert Davis ever coached the game, and since then uh, it's kind of been in motion it, you know a lot of people think that carolina has been the leader the entire time um, but the family has been very quick to dissuade people of that notion <clears throat> and so he's taken visits to missouri uh, officially georgetown officially to unc officially he's also been to duke uh, nc state alabama uh, and virginia a couple of times uh, so as of friday morning after we talked to his dad he said that they were hopeful they could make a decision next week, which would be the week starting tomorrow, um, and that they plan to announce a top three list here soon. Um, so that's kind of where things stand. He was at UVA on Saturday because his brother Cameron uh, is doing a postgrad year to try to get a football scholarship. And so he was at uh, UVA football camp. So he was there, I would imagine. I, I, I don't know if he talked to the coaches or not, but I'd imagine if you're Tony Bennett, and he's there, you, you're going to find a way to at least say hello. Uh, so that's where things stand. You know, we could be on the verge of an announcement. We we might not be, but we could be. Uh, again, they said hopefully this week, and we still don't know uh, in which class that would be. The options are 2023, uh, which would be uh, coming this summer and joining the team this fall, or 2024, which would mean enrolling at UNC in basically uh, one year from now. That's a lot. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I I know you really haven't shared anything that we haven't shared before, uh, but I don't mind saying that that that's a lot. Um, I do think uh, I, I do think you've done a great job of covering this. We've talked about Stevenson's game, Sean. I want to come to you. You know, the the reclassifying and stuff we've talked about ad, ad nauseum about you know a lot of times players just aren't physically ready. Um, aside from the physicality side of things, what would you think a player like Stevenson would need if he were to reclass, regardless of where he goes to school? Well, I, we talk about it almost every time. There's players like Elliot Cadeau that I think can be immediately ready and, and will make an impact. And then there's guys that um, you know are definitely gonna gonna struggle a little bit. And I think Steven fits into into that category if he were to reclass. He has the size, but I think just as you mentioned, from a body physicality, athletic athleticism, um, that is going to be a huge adjustment no matter where, where you go. And then I think from a skill perspective, he's nowhere near the player he's going to be in one year, two years, you know, let alone into the future. And I think right now he, he's, you know, he has the size to play the four, the five, he has some, you know, ability to play on the wing or ball handle a little bit, but there's no kind of defining skill set. I think that allows him to come in and whether it's starting or coming off the bench and make his mark. Uh, but I think in a year or two years, that's, that's not going to be a question. And I think he just needs a little bit more refinement that could come within a college program. Um, you know, but I think the reality of making a big impact next season uh, or in the fall is probably far-fetched. I, I like what you said there. I think we could all use a little bit of refinement. Um, you also mentioned Elliot Cadeau, who, is on campus in Chapel Hill. Sound the alarm. Uh, according to the social media today, we saw that both Elliot Cadeau and Zayden High have arrived in Chapel Hill. Uh, Sherelle, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the first session of camp starts either kids are checking in tonight or it starts tomorrow, one or the other. Um, but just help, help folks understand what things are like when those guys get to campus, uh, how, how things change and immediately what's thrown at them. Well, we know one place that they went, and I'll, I'll let you share that later. But um, I think pretty much uh, what they do is there's an NCAA mandated you know period where you have to get on campus and you kind of have to go through some administrator stuff and the physical and, and all those things to make sure that you're physically ready to be able to, to play. And then you have to do kind of the orientation stuff for the school. So a lot of that pre-work, that's why one of the reasons they're here early is so they can go ahead and get some of that stuff done because the second session of summer school doesn't actually start until the 26th. So they have about two weeks where all they're going to be doing is, you know, camps, uh, Carolina basketball school slash Hubert Davis camp, and then, uh, you know, playing pickup and in the weight room uh, with Jonas Ration and uh, just kind of learning the campus. So it actually is a good little pre-orientation before summer school starts. So they'll do that, um, you know, get their lockers how they want them and just, learn how to kind of be in college enjoy that kind of freedom now th these kids are a little different they've traveled the world already most of them have been overseas playing they played all across the united states so it's different from you know sean or joey or me coming into into school for the first time <laughs> uh, but there still is a, a learning curve and, and that's what they'll be doing and then also you know there's instruction that they can have with assistant coaches i think it's eight hours per week so they'll they'll get in the gym and start learning each other and uh, you know, start learning the coaches and, and learning the cadences and the sayings and the phrases and just really ingratiate themselves into everything that is Carolina basketball. So you, you stepped all over my surprise, but I'm not mad about it because it just shows you, you can tell where my head goes now. I don't know if anybody saw the photos that were on social, but um, I can tell you where that photo was taken of the High and Cadeau family with their boys. I'm not even making this up. Sean, where do you think the photo was taken? I think there's there's one guess. Johnny T-shirt. I mean, it begins with a J, ends with a Y, and there's an Ani T-shirt in the middle. Uh, yeah, the boys were in front of Johnny T-shirt. I don't think that's an accident. Uh, I don't think that's a shock. I think everybody knows that Johnny T-shirt brings the heat. And when you got you know high-profile players that are going to be the next wave of Carolina basketball talent, and that's where they go the day they get on campus, uh, you know, let let the young kids tell you. Let their actions speak louder than my words can. Uh, but since they're not here, and if you don't see the photo, just trust me. The photo was taken in front of Johnny T-shirt. Johnny T-shirt right there on East Franklin Street in Chapel Hill. 
Uh, I'm sure there was like gobs upon gobs of shopping that either had been done or was about to be done by their families because they know what Johnny T-Shirt is known for. Uh, if you can't get it at Johnny T-Shirt, you don't need it. Right there on East Franklin Street. Hit them up online. Uh, Father's Day next week. Sean, put into the ether what you need folks to get you for your first day as a father on Father's Day. What, what do you need? You want, you want gift cards? Do you want like polos? What are, what are we looking for here? Just some uh, some larger newborn clothes. That's what All right. Somebody send some somebody send some size 4T uh, <laughs> Jumpman gear to Sean Moran from Johnny T-Shirt. And, and he'll, uh, he'll give you a shout out here. Johnny T-Shirt, we love them. We appreciate how much they sponsor Inside Carolina's content. We want you, that's everybody in the chat right now, and the folks listening to this when it drops in podcast form, show Johnny T-Shirt some love. We love them. We want you to love them too. Um, Sherelle, we talked about those two guys getting to campus. Uh, there's another guy showing up tomorrow that has has wrapped up his studies at Stanford and will be ingratiating himself to the team this coming week as well as, as basketball camps get going. Uh, yeah, it's Harrison Ingram. Uh, I think he's kind of been the forgotten man. It was, it was such a big commitment <laughs> for UNC when it happened. And then Makai Stanford's on that weird West Coast quarter Tri- trimester system. or whatever it is Tri- yeah. yeah whatever it is because they're on that uh he just got done with classes for the year i think uh this past weekend uh originally when we had talked to him before the plan was i think to come a little bit later so he's actually arriving from what he said to us before about a week early um so he's supposed to be on campus on monday don't know what time um but that will bring the newcomers that unc has thus far uh, the four transfers and the two freshmen uh, that will have all uh, six of them on campus uh, back with the four scholarship guys from last year. So the 10 scholarship players who are currently on the roster will all be together beginning tomorrow. And that's kind of the start of the journey that uh, a lot of people will hope and hope will last until the last Monday in April. We can actually run fives now. Look at this. Sean, I want to ask you, I'm, I'm, this is kind of an off-the-beaten-path question, but I, I think the folks watching um, watching us live on YouTube right now might appreciate this question. Which of the transfers or the incoming guys is most likely to be the the uh, the pickup profit? Which one's the guy that you immediately you, you get him in open gym and he's just wowing things? I think the easiest answer is Cadeau, but I want to see where you go with this. I think, yeah, that's the, that's the easiest answer and probably the most likely just in terms of the wow factor, but... I think Cormac Ryan uh, could could be the one in terms of well, so he's he's been around the block in terms of Stanford and Notre Dame, uh, but I think from a shooting perspective and probably can sneak up a little bit uh, athletically and defensively. So I, I would go with with him in terms of being maybe the guy we hear a little bit more. Or maybe there's more surprise coming out of from whether it's the alumni or the people in attendance. Sherelle, I want to ask you too: Is there any? Uh... Yeah, have any movement on how the rest of this class might round out or what's going to happen with those last three scholarships? It's been a really hot topic on the message board, so I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it to you. No, uh, it seems to be all quiet on the surface at the moment. Uh, they're always looking, for is the, the word that we've gotten, uh, but we can't confirm any kind of direct contact with any players who are in the portal or any graduate transfers who have recently entered the portal. Uh, the thing about that, it, again, is there's no there's no deadline if you're a grad transfer. And if you entered the portal by May 12th, there's no deadline for you to pick a school. So conceivably, you could make a decision August 7th and say, I'm going to move into campus in two weeks and be at this you know, school X if they have a scholarship open. So, uh, you know, it 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 starts it's starting to feel like they're done because they're not going to force anybody who's not a good culture and system fit. Uh, but again, you just don't know who might show up, who might enter the portal, who's working on uh, earning credits to graduate or anything like that. So uh, roster acquisition and, and talent management is, is a 24 hour a day, 365 uh, days a year job now. And I think they are doing that. But um, there's nothing imminent as far as like uh, them uh, either adding a player uh, this coming year uh, really them contact anyone uh, that we know so far. But again, just to go back to where we were in April, uh, the UNC staff, I don't want to say they're secretive, but they just don't um, advertise a lot of what they're doing. And typically the players they recruit don't do a lot of advertising either. So they could have contacted someone, but 
as of uh, eight fifteen on Sunday, June eleventh, we are not aware of them contacting anyone uh, who's in the portal. You're not saying they're secretive, but you're not not saying they're secretive. I feel you. I got you. Um, so let's talk about some Pango stuff. Let's talk about some prep players. Sean, I know you've been kind of champing at the bit a little bit to get this out. Uh, Pango's updates, both Drake Powell and James Brown showing out a little bit. I've seen some clips. Boys look good despite those <laughs> hideous uniforms they were having to wear. Those things were just absolutely hot garbage, uh, uglier than the bowling shoe type stuff. But, hey, it's whatever the kids want to wear, right? Um, Sherelle's popping his collar. I'm assuming he's got on like a Pango shirt or something underneath that. Sean, what what jumped out at you from uh, both Powell and James Brown's performances this past week? Well, I think, uh, you know, those those jerseys, you're going to be seeing those in all the 24-7 and all the other photos, you know, for the next year to year to three years. Um, so you can probably get used to them. Um, you know, I, I think early on, and I'm just, uh, I'm actually scrolling through some of the box scores right now, but I think early on you saw Drake Powell shooting the ball well uh, as well, you know, in, in addition to his athleticism popping up. Um, I think probably one of the biggest surprises is he didn't make the top 30 um, all-star game. He was in the, the top 60, which um, yeah, I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about, about that, but that, that was probably the biggest surprise to me. James Brown was in the top 30, uh, but it was a chance for, you know, those two guys to get to play a little bit more. Um, you know, I also think Drake Powell has more important things going on, uh, actually tonight with the U19 tryouts as well. So, um, you know, the, the Pangos event uh, is a fun one. I used to go when it was in LA, definitely more of a kind of a true all-star. Um, people will get after it when, when they, when they want to, but for the most part, it's defense is optional uh, and it's, it, it can be a little uh, highlight laden in, in terms of there, but there's always a ton, a ton of talent there. Um, also a lot of talent that, is up and coming as well. So it is a good chance for people to, to go against guys from other shoe circuits. Uh, but once again, I think Drake Powell played pretty well early on, shot the ball better than he had been doing in the Nike EYBL outside of that first session. Um, but I think more importantly for him is, you know, how does he do uh, at the U19 tryouts, which is, which is pretty steep in terms of competition. Shrill, uh, again, I'm going to show my, my relative uh, inexperience here, but James Brown on some of the films I saw from Pangos, he was trying to take some souls, which having not been kind of a highlight player for Mocan Elite, his new squad this past summer thus far, is that shocking or is that just who he is? Or maybe is it the fact that maybe he got a little annoyed and maybe he got a little challenged at Pangos. What, what do you see or what do you think maybe, maybe caused that to, to come out of the young man? Uh, like Sean said, uh, it's more of a free-flowing game, so uh, there's not as lo as much kind of banging down low. It's not quite as physical. Um, and, you know, something that we've heard from people close to him for some time is that he can do a lot more than kind of what he shows, and he plays the role he's asked to play. Uh, so I think it's a combination of that. Maybe he has some things that we hadn't seen. Um, and then also uh, is it is a loose environment where – it's a lot of up and down and he's gotten into really good shape and he's able to run the court. Um, not that it was ever bad, but he's able mm -hmm. to run the court better than he did a year ago. And it really was a year ago at Pangos where kind of, he, I don't want to say he blew up, but that was where he started getting the national attention when Carolina called and Duke called and Indiana and Michigan, et cetera, all called him, um, you know, pretty much right after that event. So it might be just, he's real comfortable there. Um, but I, it's probably a combination of all three in that, um, he's showing some things that maybe weren't there a year ago. Um, and then also the the style of play that's at Pankos. One of the things we've well, talked about. Oh, go ahead, John. No, I was going to say one, uh, going back a few years at, at Pangos, uh, when Dayron Sharp was a, a rising senior, he, he played there. And you can imagine in that setting for bigs, it's not the most uh, conducive uh, to show showing your skill, but I remember watching him and he was every possession defense offensively and defensively he was spreading the floor, running hard, um, you know, grabbing rebounds. Finally, he got the ball, uh, you know, so he wasn't going to give it up. And, and I think he had two or three possessions in a row where he just went at whoever was guarding him and they had no prayer and he showed off a few different uh, offensive moves, but um, obviously that's going, going way back. And 
you know, for the bigs, James Brown, et cetera, oftentimes it's not a true showcase of your abilities, but I know he got some, he got some shots, I think five of six in the, the top 30 game. One of the things that, again, just in what little I saw from the Pangos event and James Brown, we've talked about Bryce Johnson here on this show a lot, a lot in context of how much he improved from his start at UNC to his senior year at UNC. But I see flashes of young Bryce Johnson in James Brown right now. I don't know if it's just the uh, athleticism or maybe I'm just making an easy comp. I know, Sean, you hate comps, but uh, allow me to be a, allow me to be a dullard if I can. Um Sean, you mentioned the uh, U19 trials coming up. What are you expecting to see out of that? I mean, you know, I recognize that's a very competitive environment with some uh, some high level coaching and scout work. What are you expecting to come out of that? Yeah, I mean, it'll, I think it'll be really interesting because uh, this will be Jake Powell's first, U, uh, at least to my knowledge, first USA basketball appearance, and it usually takes. Uh, a little bit to get adjusted, um, one to the altitude, but two just to the structure and, and how everything goes. And this one, um, you know, you can the U 19s happen every other other year, so you can go back to some of the rosters. But um, you know, he's going to be participating with some of the other top players in the rising senior class, uh, but also people that are going to be freshmen uh, getting ready to step onto college campus either now or in a few weeks, uh, as well as players that play their freshman year and are going in their sophomore year. So you're, you're going into a wide, wide range. I think around 30 people uh, are there from a competition standpoint. And if you go back and look, for the most part, the guys that have made the U19 team um, that are going into their high school senior year, uh, they've either been lottery picks uh, or have had tremendous professional careers. Uh, so, you, I mean, just a few names, the 2019 2019 team was loaded with uh, Kay Cunningham, Scotty Barnes, Jalen Green, Evan Mobley, uh, and a few others. But you can go back to 2015 with you know Tatum, Giles, and uh, Ferguson and Josh Jackson. So each each year when the when the high school players do make it, I mean those are for the most you can kind of put a check check mark <laughs> and they're they're going to have a, a good career. So it's not to say if somebody doesn't make it, um, they're not because I've seen a lot of very talented players whether it's u16 u17 or u19 not make it but i think it'll be a great um experience for him getting to play in that type of environment um and if he does make it i think it, once again it just kind of showcases that trajectory he's been uh really starting from from last summer and the fall but uh once again it's all about fit so you can have the most talented players but they need to be able to fit into what that coach and the coaching staff is trying to run uh so for me once again, not going to take anything away if he doesn't make it, but I think it'll be a great chance just to test his skills and and get that type of of playing you know playing ability, uh, especially if he does make it, going against some of the top European teams uh, in the world and and those players. So it'll be uh, interesting. I know UNC. I'm not sure who exactly was there, but um, UNC. A lot of other schools were there for the night session tonight. So it'll be interesting just monitoring who's coming out of that uh, and the different cuts. Sure. Anything you want to add about the U19 trials? Yeah, I just say from a recruiting respect perspective, uh, Ian Jackson, also a UNC commit, mm -hmm. is there. Um, and he's kind of really the only other one that Carolina, he is the only other one that Carolina's recruiting. And um, and he does, yeah. he does have, you know, he was on the U17 gold medal team last year. So he's, as well as the U16. So he's a guy that comes in, yeah, kind of a USA veteran. He's got the pedigree, yeah. Yeah, yeah of sorts. Um, so you could you could probably pencil pencil him in if I had to guess. Um, and then sorry to cut Sherelle off, but just one other. I mean, for these, it's all about uh, you know you got to play hard, you got to hustle, you got to be a team player. Uh, if if you're not playing defense, if you're lackadaisical, it doesn't matter what your reputation is, what what rank you are, you'll get you'll get cut um, as soon as they release that first batch of names. So it, it, you know, it kind of I think suits Drake's nature. He's a guy that. Uh, can fit in, play a few different roles, especially defensively. And if he's shooting the ball well in Colorado Springs, I think he could uh, easily showcase, you know, just given his his height, his size, and what he brings, I think he definitely has a has a good opportunity to make the team. Appreciate that, Sean. All right, uh, fellas, take a couple of questions before we get out of here tonight. Again, this is Coast to Coast Podcast here on InsideCarolina.com. I'm Joey Powell. He's Sean Moran. Uh, also, other he, Sherelle McMillan. Thank you guys for being a part of the show. Shout out to everybody who's in the chat tonight uh, on a, a Sunday evening. 
Summer's rolling. Good things happening. Shout out to all my Man City fans, fellow Blues out there. Boys pulled the treble yesterday, winning the UCL. Um, so we've got a question from Preston from Greensboro. And I like this. I think you know, it's, it's an easy question to ask, but I think there's a lot of moving parts, and I want to see how you guys want to answer this. Trell, I'll hit you first. Preston asks, is this team, as is, a top 20 team? I mean, I get. I don't know. I, we'll we'll see. Um, it's <laughs> come on, no, man. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's. I mean, I, I appreciate the question, Preston. I just think it's kind of impossible to answer, uh, just because um, we just we don't know how they're going to fit together. Last year, they were preseason number one, and we thought they had the chemistry and they had yeah. everything coming back. And you know, it it looked on paper like it was going to be great, and it wasn't. And this year, it looks on paper like it could be good. Um, but you, you just don't know it, a lot. You know, there's so many questions you have to ask. And I always say that the more questions you have to ask, probably the less likely chance that the team is what you think it might be. So, like, you know, can Elliot Cadeau come in and, and be a, a lead point guard and be really good in the ACC? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, we kind of know where R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott are. Can Harrison Ingram, Ingram um, in a different role, in a different team, you know, can he shoot better? You know, can he... Um, acquiesce it and be sometimes the number two or three or four guy offensively. Whereas at Stanford, he had the ball in his hands the most. Cormac Ryan, uh, you know, his shooting percentage slumped last year. Can he shoot better next year? So if you start answering all those questions with yes, then absolutely. They're a top 15, top 20, top 10 team team or, or whatever. But um, if you start answering those questions with no's, then I, I, I get a little bit worried because there is, um, there is, I don't say a lack of depth, but you know, kind of one injury can can really mm -hmm. hurt this team at really any position. Like, if one of the guards gets hurt, you know, you're you're thin there. If one of the wings get hurt, gets hurt, you're really really thin there. If one of the bigs gets hurt, you're kind of thin there. So, as is, I think it's a good ten. It's solid. They can do a lot of things. They're versatile. They can shoot. They're smart. They're experienced. But I just worry about that injury bug a little bit, and then kind of um, how Cado will. Uh, you know, function as, you know, potentially a starting guard as, as a freshman, uh, as a reclass. So sure. all that to all that to say, yes, but nobody really knows. Preston from Greensboro. Same question, Sean. I'm going to go a bit more definitive. Yes. On, on this one. Um, you know, I think last summer was again, hard to, see in the time, but obviously play Monday morning quarterback, you can see the lackadaisical nature, I think over the summer that the players had as well as really the fit um, in, in terms of how players mesh. I think there's still a ton of questions on how that fit will, will come together this year. But I think from the returning players uh, you have really the embarrassment of last season. And then from the newcomers, you know, they're, they're all trying to, get to where UNC was two years ago in terms of making that championship game. So I think as long as the chemistry, you know, as long as something doesn't come off the, <laughs> off the wheels on, on this one, I think the chemistry should be good. Uh, it's not going to be a finished product until the end of the year, especially with Cadeau. And I think the improvement we'll see, but the pieces fit. I think there's more of a hunger. Uh, and once again, when you're looking at the college landscape, there's maybe only a few teams that are returning a lot of players that you can, for the most part, check the box and say, oh, yeah, they're going to be really good. Everybody else is uh, trying to trying to figure out who they're going to be. And I think with that talent and with the experience, uh, I think for sure they're a, a top 20 team. Uh, for the death, death perspective, injuries, you know, especially Armando or, or somebody else can, can definitely play a key. I've always been harping, you know, before some of the decommitments or transfers, where's all the playing time? going to come from in terms of making everybody happy now going through you know as Sherelle was talking about the 10 now I almost wish there was like DeMarco Dunn if, if he was still around just to have a little bit size a little more flexibility on the wing and some shooting I think would be perfect but once again when you boil it down I think there's 10 guys you know eight eight to nine that you feel pretty comfortable with and I always said eight I think is the ideal um you know number that you want to be playing with so you know, we'll, we'll see after last year. I don't think anybody can make predictions, but I, I think there is a, um, a better fit uh, going forward and hopefully a better hunger. Yeah, I think there's something to be said, too, about the top 20. I mean, you guys did a great job of mentioning 
how many variables there are. I think this North Carolina team has, from what we know of the players that are coming in, you know, most of them transfers are talented. I think this roster is a talented roster, but we have no idea what the chemistry is going to look like. Sherelle alluded to uh, last year's preseason ranking being absolutely worthless. Uh, and I think the, the, the fact that there's not a lot known about most of the other teams in college basketball, I think that makes that number 20, you know, who are the top 20 teams, but I think that makes that much more of a, a nebulous number and hard to pin down. So if you can't pin down the other 19, I'm not sure how you can pin down North Carolina as one of those. But uh, yeah. again, who, who we know of, of returning on the roster, I do think is a talented bunch. Go ahead, Trill. Yeah, I, I was going to agree with you. When I say kind of like uh, I'm a little trigger shy to say top 20, it's not because <laughs> we all are, have, bro. It's OK. It, yeah, it's not because they don't have top 20 talent. I think a lot of most programs would trade places with North Carolina with what sure. they have, you know, with a former Pac-12 freshman of the year and an All-American big and uh, All-ACC guard and another guy who started uh, so many games at, at Notre Dame, another guy who started so many games at Louisville. Uh, you know, what was the number one point guard in 2024, I think he's the number two point guard in 2023. So there are a lot of a lot of teams that would trade. And I haven't even mentioned Jalen Washington and Seth Trimble. Mm-hmm. A lot of teams that would trade for that. The issue is we saw last year on the court, it just didn't work. It just didn't work. mesh. It, it never, it never did what it was supposed to do. It never, it never turned over. Um, so it's like, you know, you have to be a little cognizant of that. And that has to impact how you, if you're going to try to look into the future, that has to impact how you look at it. Because yeah, if it's just talent, you know, one through 10, yeah, top 20, it, it's probably top 10 talent, one through 10, but there are other variables at play that you have to account for. And chemistry is a huge one. I mean, I, I think you had one of the worst three-point shooting teams uh, last year. You had one of the worst ball movement teams last year. And I think going back to Cadeau, I urge patience with him because I think there will be some some growing pains. But I think that you know his his special passing ability, that gift that he has, I think will uh, make the ball move quicker. Hopefully, players are having more fun and uh, ideally a better product to watch. So once again, not putting the weight on his shoulders, but I think just that, that intangible that he brings will, will go a long, a long ways. Well, as, as always, y'all put it so well and so eloquently and your uh, eloquently and your perspectives are, are incredibly valued. Um, let's put a bow on the show. We'll get out of here for tonight. Uh, a special thanks to everybody watching uh, in the chat. Who's made a, a made their Sunday evenings include us. We're thankful for that. Thanks to Johnny t-shirt for sponsoring to, uh, to John Siegley for producing uh, and to Sean Moran and Sherelle McMillan. But uh, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Rate, review. If you've joined us live, we appreciate you guys too. We'll catch you next time on the Coast to Coast Podcast. I'm Joey Powell. We'll see you down the road here on InsideCarolina.com.